This is Epicenter, episode 362 with guest Simon Polro. Hi, I'm Sebastian Couture, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level, and we fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like Epicenter, the best way to support us is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're on a Mac or iOS device, it's super easy. Just go to epicenter.rocks slash Apple, and that'll take you exactly where you need to go to leave us a review. Today, my guest is Simon Polro, and he is the president of ADAN, or the Association for the Development of Digital Assets. It is based here in Paris and has a mission to promote the development of the crypto industry in France and more broadly in Europe. And as I mentioned here before, I'm a staff member of this organization as its communication director. Simon's one of the pillars of the crypto space in France. We met way back in the day when just a few people were talking about crypto here. We would often uh, meet at meetups and speak together on panels. And around that time, he co-founded Aseth, which was renamed to Ethereum France last year, and of course, host the ETC conference in Paris. So around the summer of last year, he told me about this idea to create an industry body which would represent the French crypto industry. I was immediately on board and we started working on the project. We recruited the early members and we established the, the foundations for what would become Adan. And it all came together in January of this year. And we now have close to 50 member companies and we're a permanent staff of uh, three people plus one intern. I wanted to get Simon on the podcast to talk about the digital finance package. It's a regulatory proposal that was drafted by the EU Commission and released to the public last month. And since we got our hands on this document, we've been working hard to understand it, dissect it, and establish our positions with regards to this regulation. So the scope of this regulation is really broad, and it covers nearly every type of activity which is related to cryptocurrencies, utility tokens, stable coins, and security tokens in Europe. In addition to being broad, it puts enormous restrictions on the DeFi ecosystem. It's not so much that it restricts DeFi actors to do certain things or act in certain ways, but it simply ignores most of DeFi applications and use cases, and thus it makes it nearly impossible for DeFi to continue to exist in its current form. In the way that this regulation is currently drafted, it's difficult to see how DeFi stablecoins like DAI could continue to be considered legal and most of the innovative token issuance models that we've seen emerge recently simply couldn't interact with regulated exchanges. Since this regulation came out, our goal has been to put together a task force of companies and other European industry associations. And then from here, with the right partners, we want to lobby at the EU level, which is, of course, a long and costly process. What's at stake here is the EU's competitiveness on the world stage. Of course, regulation should protect consumers and weed out bad actors, but at the same time, it should leave room for innovation and proportionality when it comes to crypto startups. So we went a little long on this one, but I think it was worth it because it's important to understand what might be coming to Europe. But it's also a call to action to join us in our effort to preserve innovation in DeFi. And one of the ways you can do that is by becoming a member of ADAN. So be sure to stick around until the end where we talk about that and other ways that you can support us and stay informed. A bit of housekeeping, we're hosting another virtual meetup on October 29th. It's at 1800 UTC, so that's 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, and 8 p.m. in Western Europe. We did the last one in the spring, and it was lots of fun. There was about 30 people there. We could just kind of chat and hang out together in a Zoom call. So please come and join us. If you want to register, it's at epicenter.rocks slash meetup. Algorand is putting together a free webinar to show developers just what you can do with the platform. It's a one-hour tutorial, and it'll cover use cases like crowdfunding, asset tokenization, supply chain management, and gaming applications. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on during the interview. But for now, here's my conversation with Simon Polero. I'm here with Simon Polero, who is the president of ADAN. Simon, thanks for joining me. Thank you very much, Sebastian. So we were just saying before this, it's going to be a little strange because we know each other so well. And also, 
you know, we're used to speaking in French. And so <laughs> this is going to be a little bit of a challenge for, for me and you to not like slip back into French. And also these questions are a little weird sometimes, I think, because, you know, I'm trying to put myself in the position of, you know, a, a listener who doesn't necessarily know this topic. And since I've been, you know, so, so, so since we've both been working uh, very closely on these topics, it, it's going to, uh, you know, I'll have to make an effort to sound like an outsider or to ask questions as if I was an outsider. Um, yeah, let, let, so, let's do our best. <laughs> yeah. So uh, l let's tell our listeners a bit about your background and how you became involved in crypto. Yes, of course. So I have a legal background. Uh, I was a lawyer before uh, jumping in the crypto space uh, and a tax lawyer, more precisely. So I did uh, tax declaration, tax consultancy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, but I've always been very passionate about technology and I had stumbled upon Bitcoin quite a few times on, on uh, news websites in, I don't know, 2011, 2013. I mined a few Bitcoins in uh, 2013 and then I just ab abandoned the, the, the topic. And I jumped again one last time, I would say in uh, 2015. When I heard about Ethereum, well, first I was just, I just, I just wanted to to buy a few bitcoins just to invest a bit of money. But then I heard about Ethereum and about the smart contracts, about everything surrounding uh, automatic execution of transactions on blockchain, and I was really hooked. I think it was my uh, legal background that just um, it clicked with me when I when I heard about the fact that. You could do complex transac transactions on, on a blockchain that could be fully automated and, and then you can audit the transaction afterwards. Well, it was really like, uh, I was like, okay, th this will be huge. This will be very significant for, uh, for, for the finance, for the value in general. Uh, so that's where... I decided to, uh, yeah, to be a bit more than a hobbyist and to create projects around uh, the, the crypto assets industry in general. Uh, first, in addition to my work as a lawyer, and then, and then very quickly it became my full-time job. Yeah, in the beginning, I remember when, I mean, in, in, in the early days of Ethereum in 2000. 15 and 16 I seem to recall that there were a lot of people who were you know like with a legal background that were looking at ethereum and interested in ethereum because of this notion of like automatic contract execution and like back then we had a couple of people on the show that were you know looking at ethereum from that perspective you, you worked at a law firm uh, and I'll let you talk a little bit about about that part of your career and how it relates to crypto but were you finding around you that other lawyers, uh, or other people with a legal background, you know, somewhat drawn to uh, Ethereum for, for that reason? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, it was very uh, naive, I would say, uh, attraction, because it was uh, based on the, yeah, the, the, the best case scenario of what, a, of what a smart contract would one day become. But, but still, you know, it was the potential of the technology to, to, to be able to execute transactions automatically. That was quite a bit, a bit, uh, magic as as a lawyer, I was like, uh, okay, there's so many legal implications to this. I need to to research it. And at this time, I was one of the first lawyers that was really as technical on the subject. So I had quite a good understanding on the on the main concept. Even if I am not I'm not a developer or something like that or an engineer, but I I, I was really interested also by the technical side. So I think that was what made me stick with it even though, of course, the, prom the promises weren't there. So a lot of lawyers just abandoned the subject. But I still think today that it's, uh, it's still possible that the, the potential that we saw in 2016 will, will realize sometime. And I think it's, it's beginning to, to materialize uh, right now. So, but it's true that when I, when I first presented the, the, the cryptocurrency and the blockchain, because the blockchain was the, the magic word at this time, uh, to my associates, to the to the, the partners of the firm, uh, I was not a partner, unfortunately, but I presented to the partners, and they were excited by the idea. And I think most of the lawyers that that touched the subject at this time were excited by the idea. But then after that, of course, there's all the, the realization that it's it's very very early, and there's no not, nothing much to do if you are not really involved in projects as a lawyer in the in the space. Yeah. 
Algorand's running a free webinar to teach developers how they can use the platform to build sophisticated applications for use cases like crowdfunding, asset tokenization, supply chain management, and even gaming applications. You'll learn how to get started with the command line tools and use the SDK and REST APIs. You'll also learn about the Algorand Foundation's grant program and additional funding opportunities that the Algorand ecosystem has to offer. So if you're building on a blockchain protocol that has unfeasibly high transaction fees and doesn't provide the speed you need, or if you work for a large enterprise or financial institution and are interested in learning how to build applications that could integrate in your current technology stack, or if you have no blockchain experience at all and just are looking to take that first step into something new, well, this webinar could be for you. Visit algorand.com slash epicenter to sign up. Once again, it's free and it's happening on November 17th. But if you're listening to this after that date, no worries, you can still go to that page and watch the replay. We'd like to thank Algorand for their support of the podcast. And so what was your role then? I mean, I, I, I know that you worked quite a bit in the early days of your career uh, at, at this law firm and looking into the legal and regulatory implications of crypto, but particularly, particularly from the funding uh, perspective, uh, this was around the ICO boom. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, of course. So... First, I was really attracted by the by you know Ethereum in general, uh, basically. So I was uh, quite passionate. I built a website called Ethereum France, basically talking about Ethereum in French. I, I wrote a lot of articles about uh, all all the aspects around Ethereum, ranging from how to buy Ether to uh, what is a D app, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was really the objective was to basically uh, educate everyone on what is Ethereum and the potential of it. And then I, of course, I, the more technical I, I became and the, the more involved in the project I became, the, uh, the, the more I, I saw the potential of some projects. So I was really interested in following those, those projects and helping them also, of course, in the legal side, even if it was very really, uh, preliminary at this time. And I think the, the tipping point was uh, DEF CON 2. Uh, when I went in Shanghai and met all those projects and all those people, passionate people who were building things with those re really primitive tools, right? At this time, it was very difficult to build a project in Ethereum, on Ethereum. That, that's where I think I, I saw the passion and I saw the, the community and I was like, okay, I need to uh, be even more focused. And from there, you know, you're right. A few, a few months later, the, the, the ICO uh, craze uh, started. I had the chance and the opportunity to to uh, be an advisor for a few projects that I met at DevCon 2, uh, namely iExec, for example. And it was really, really interesting to see all those ideas uh, becoming actual projects and uh, very good projects, right? iExec is still a, a very big uh, component in the space. So yeah, that was really what how, how the, the ID progressed and how I was more and more involved. And then uh, at one point I was like, okay, I need to be even more involved. And, I, and, and then I quit my lawyer's job and I joined uh, Variable, the consensus uh, project. And it was at, at this time trying to build a derivative products on Ethereum. So it was really DeFi before DeFi. Unfortunately, this project it did not uh, came through, but it was really a fantastic experience for one year and a half. I joined uh, an exchange platform, also a French exchange platform called LGO, and I worked a bit for them to develop their activities in, in France. And then Aiden, that's where uh, I had the idea of creating this uh, association. Uh, so you see, I've, I come from a legal background, uh, but in those two startups, I was not the legal guy, not only the legal guy, I was really on operation. So I had the opportunity to see all the issues that you have when you try to create a, a, um, a project in, uh, in the, the crypto space uh, in France, specifically because I was based in France. And, and from there, I, I saw that there were very uh, significant issues that needed probably to be solved at a more global level. And that's where the idea of the association was born. Yeah, and I, I remember when you first told me about this, I think it was in the summer of 2019. And, you know, around this time, 
there were other associations in France. Uh, there, there were a few, and but you know the way I would characterize them is that they were uh, enthusiast associations, and although they they did a great job at you know, educating people about crypto and trying to get people involved in the crypto space, there was not so much of a mandate to grow the industry and uh, bring together industry players as a as a as a sort of force right um, and so this idea of of Adan came to you particularly to uh, to create an industry body so c- can you tell us a little bit about what is the role of Adan in the French ecosystem but also moving forward like what is the role of Adan at a more supranational level at the EU level yes of course so basically, that's that's it. It's an industry body. Uh, the the idea was really to make the crypto assets industry existing as an industry, like because uh, before that it was a few companies working towards some goals that some were similar, some were dissimilar, of course, and then there were competitors, but there was no body to represent the industry as a whole and to talk with public authorities, with private sector, uh, with representatives, with other associations as the uh, representation of the crypto assets industry. And I think it was really detrimental to the development of the industry because there were no clear voices, there were no clear uh, representative, and it was very difficult for everyone except the digital asset sector to understand what, what, what it was about and what what were the issues we faced and, and what we could bring basically to the economy because it's a very specific sector of activity that's still uh, not very well understood still today. Yeah, if you don't have someone to discuss with to discuss with and to basically ask your questions to, it's very difficult to to know more and even to know that this sector exists, right? So that was really the first objective. And then from there, of course, there's so many things to solve, so many problems uh, that the industry is facing right now. Just to develop its activity, we we are working on, uh, you know, accessing uh, bank accounts for uh, crypto asset sector, for example, uh, and and how those actors should implement KYC ML procedures, uh, how those actors can finance themselves, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and how the French uh, public, the, uh, the, the French state, but also the French private sector can help the industry grow, etc., etc. By the way, we should mention that ADAN stands for Association pour le Développement des Actifs Numériques, which means the Association for the Development of Crypto Assets or Digital Assets. We chose to go with the name Digital Assets because we felt that that was kind of representative of uh, you know the entire industry. And um, But the French crypto sector... You know, has developed since 2013, I think, or something like that, with the first exchange. And of course, Ledger uh, being one of the major players here in France and sort of well known for, uh, for, what it's, for what it's built over the years. Let, you know, talk about a little bit about uh, this, this political um, desire to, for France to be crypto country, right? Like this, uh, you know, crypto first that we saw from the government in uh, in 2018, I think. Can you can you talk a little bit about that context? Of course, of course. First of all, I'd like to precise that uh, I think the first exchange was in 2011. It was Paymium, uh, well, the ancestor of Paymium right. at this time. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, BTC, yeah, so, what was it again? Bitcoin uh, Central. <laughs> Bitcoin Central, yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's even older than that. Um, and I think it was the, 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 the earliest exchange in the world, right? So uh, that, that's significant. But yeah, you're right that um, the industry was seen in... I don't know, in 2018, 2017, 2018, by, by the government. Basically, what happened is that uh, the regulator in France, uh, the Autorité des Marchés Financiers, they opened this fintech, this whole fintech department that is uh, listening to fintech projects and helping them becoming uh, regulated. And because there was so so much openness on this, uh, on this fintech department, the blockchain project, the crypto assets project in France, they just went to the regulator and they they presented their, their, their projects, it, whether it was an ICO, whether it was uh, 
we went to see them with a variable, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So any kind of project went to see the regulator, and they were uh, really impressed. Right? <laughs> they were like, "Okay, what's going on? What's this uh, whole crypto asset sector that that's uh, developing in in France? Uh, is there something significant to do there?" And they built a knowledge at the regulator uh, level that they passed through to the ministry, right? And the ministry. They, they saw this subject and they were like, okay, this is very interesting. Uh, maybe there's something to do. So the Financial Market Authority uh, to, you know, met all these crypto projects and then they yeah. went up to the, to the economy minister and was like, okay, here, there's something here. Exactly. Uh, and from there, there's, there were like studies and, and of course they, they tried to better understand the, the, the sector, how it worked and everything and everything. And then there were the ICO boom that just made everything go faster basically because they were they, they felt like okay we need to to do something we need to regulate we need to uh, there's so many things happening there and maybe if we are quick to give a clear uh, regulation to the sector uh, that will help actor grow because they will know what they have to do what they can do what they can't do etc etc so that that's where the idea grew from okay what's this thing to we need to uh bring well to help the crypto asset sector uh, grow in uh, in France and this came into fruition in 2018 with a law that called pact law that created the whole regulation for the crypto asset sector um, and there were very positive uh, political messages also sent at this time saying yeah we want a crypto nation we want to, to build a, a dedicated sector of activity etc etc so that happened all this happened in 2018. But then, of course, there's time to apply the regulation and the regulation came into force in France uh, effectively uh, in March this year. So uh, now we have a very clear legal framework in France for crypto assets actors, uh, basically market market actors and also for ICOs. But yeah, on this, it's a bit late, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, that's that's enough about France. Let's uh, because our listeners might get bored with with uh, all this stuff that's very specific to France. But let's yeah, yeah, yeah. broaden it a little bit and talk about Europe and where where there's a lot at stake here. And this is going to be the bulk of our conversation. Uh, we're talking, of course, of the digital finance package, which uh, was uh, drafted and released in late September. So you know, just for 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 context, what are the high level principles of cryptocurrency regulation in Europe, what are the major frameworks that cryptocurrencies and cryptocurrency actors fall under uh, in, in the EU? Okay, there's a few um, big ways of uh, regulating cryptos in Europe. Uh, basically, uh, we can we can dissociate yeah, two main uh, ways of, of regulating. The first one is considering that, that crypto assets are uh, securities all of them, and make them fall into the financial regulation in general. So uh, that's the approach taken notably by Germany uh, and a few other countries. So if you are operating, for example, a crypto, crypto assets exchange in, in Germany, then you have to be a regulated uh, financial exchange. That, that's, uh, that's as simple as that. So that's the first, the first way of doing it, which is uh, quite easy to do, of course, but uh, can lead to some uh, inefficiencies and adaptation because the financial regulation is is very strong and and very difficult to uh, apply for uh, small actors like the crypto asset sector. And then you have the countries that try to create a dedicated framework for crypto assets. I already mentioned France, of course, did this, but uh, you have Gibraltar, you have Malta, you have Estonia. They all have like a crypto license. Uh, where basically you uh, you describe your project and you you have specific obligation uh, that are adapted to the crypto assets and uh, that may mention for example custody or this kind of issues that are very specific to the crypto asset sector. So these are bespoke regimes that are created by national governments in order to yeah. help players and, and sort of startups in the crypto space get started without all of the encumbrances and red tape and everything of you know a, a very uh, complex regulatory framework as exists in the financial space. That's exactly this. And then on top of this, there's uh, 
irrespective of the of the local regulation, there's an obligation for each member state to uh, put into place regulations on KYC AML for all the all the exchanges that uh, deal with euro and all the custodians. That's from a EU regulation, so it needs to be applied everywhere in the EU. Uh, it's the the AML five uh, directive. Cryptocurrency startups in Europe are regulated at an EU level by AML5, which implies that every exchange or custodian conducts AML KYC on their customers. But other than that, other than uh, this uh, specific um, know your customer regulation, there hasn't been until now a framework at the EU level to regulate things like you know, specifically, you know, how tokens are listed by exchanges or uh, things like stable coins or things like ICOs. Until now, these have m- mostly been regulated at a local level. Exactly. Okay. So let's let's now jump into this, this digital finance package. What is this digital finance package uh, that was released by the EU Commission and how, how does it change fundamentally this, this situation that we're currently in? Yeah, so the digital finance package, it's a big package, very, very, very big. As its name suggests, it covers everything digital and finance. And the objective of the digital finance package is basically to make the EU competitive in an area where the finance is increasingly digitized. So it's very broad and it covers, there's a lot of different regulations that covers a lot of different areas. But of course, what interests us is a few pieces of this regulation that will concern specifically the crypto assets industry, namely uh, the MiCA regime, the markets in crypto assets, and then uh, the pilot regime for the security tokens. Those are the two components that are specifically targeted to crypto assets in general. So basically assets uh, registered on a blockchain. And the idea behind this, uh, this regulation is to consider the crypto assets as a very specific new uh, asset class. So it's uh, quite similar to the approach that was taken by France, for example, that really considering the crypto asset as a, as a different industry as the other ones, and to create a, a specific set of rules, uh, a bespoke regime, that will apply to those actors and to the assets they are touching. So that, that's what will happen. Um, that, that's what the, the regime uh, sets, sets, uh, sets in motion. Every single crypto assets actor uh, in Europe will be regulated by Mika. And every single uh, issuer of security token can use the pilot regime, which is a very specific uh, uh, kind of sandbox for security token. Okay. So when you say every single crypto currency actor in Europe will be regulated under Mika. Um, I think we're going to spend most of this time talking about Mika because it's the one that concerns DeFi more so than the, the pilot regime, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But w- when you say every single actor, who are you talking about here? Give us some examples of like, who are the people who are the companies that are getting affected and regulated by this? Broadly speaking, Mika is uh, creating a new category of actors. They called a crypto asset service provider. So if you are providing a service with crypto assets, you uh, fall into this category. And it's very inspired from uh, the financial regulation, right? So basically, the crypto asset service providers are the custodians, uh, trading platforms, exchange, execution of order reception and transmission of orders of crypto assets. So if you look at the different financial services in MIFID, which is the financial regulation in Europe, just a copy paste, basically adapted, of course, because that's the custody, but for the finance, for the, for the crypto asset sector. So if you are uh, providing a service, you are an intermediary, basically you're an exchange, you help people uh, buy or sell crypto assets you advise them on crypto assets, you will be uh, regulated under this, uh, this regulation. So you are a CASP. And then there's a, regula- a part of the regulation that is focused on the issuance of crypto assets. So any issuer of crypto assets will also be regulated, whatever the, the mean of, of uh, issuing the crypto asset. 
and there's specific um, dispositions on stable coins. And this is a very, very sensitive topic with a lot of pages of regulation. Just to give you an idea, the whole regulation is like uh, uh, 176 pages. So to just on Mika regime. And the stablecoin part is like a third of that. So it's very, very uh, significant. Uh, and there's obviously a focus on, on of the commission on stablecoin. So there's crypto, crypto asset service providers and token issuers. So in crypto asset service providers, uh, tell me if I'm, I'm right here, but we have exchanges, we have anyone who's a custodian, and we have any company that is providing services to holders or users of crypto assets. And then in the issuer category, we have any entity that is by some means or another issuing or creating any form of cryptocurrency or crypto asset. Yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly this. Okay. So let's talk about what are some of the impacts. Uh, and I think the most interesting thing here is the issuance. I think the, the crypto asset service provider aspect concerns companies that were are somewhat regulated and probably would have been regulated anyway, like we were to expect that. So like exchanges, companies that are usually perhaps at the periphery between crypto and and the traditional finance market. I mean, of course, there's also actors in there that would not have been like at this periphery. So, but talking about the issuance, this is where I think it's particularly in interesting because it's it's hard sometimes to pinpoint who is the issuer of a token. And there's a lot of kind of gray area there that even we haven't really been able to to sort out like how these these participants would be would be regulated. So, can you talk a little bit about like go into detail about that issuer portion? who it concerns, and what are the challenges here? One of the things to have in mind when you are dealing with this uh, draft regulation uh, is that basically the commission tried to uh, cover everything. Uh, it's, it's, there's very broad definitions, and an issue of crypto assets is basically any kind of legal entity that creates a crypto asset, whatever it means. And the first thing is that you will fall into the regulation as soon as you issue something and you and you and you sell it you exchange it against fiat or other crypto assets and it's only if you are a legal entity that you fall into the regulation so that that that's interesting uh, because the first thing is that any kind of ico basically ico any kind of, of any form right of any of any uh, of any significance will fall into the into the regulation. So if you are uh, issuing a token to finance your project, you will be regulated. But then if you are uh, not a legal entity, you are basically excluded from the regulation and it won't apply to you. And that has some consequences, which we'll get into in, in a little bit. Exactly. Let's talk concretely about sort of projects that we know in the industry or the, like in, in the DeFi space. Like, can you can you give some concrete example as to you know how some of the projects uh, let, let's let's take I don't know like urine finance for example or a, a, a Dex uh, or an you know an automated market maker like uh, Uniswap how, you know, let's maybe kind of look at these different examples and how they would be regulated under Mika. Th those are very uh, interesting uh, examples. So, for example, Uniswap, they have issued a token. They have sold a portion of it to, it, to its investors, attributed to its investors a, a portion of it. They have distributed with an airdrop a few of it to users of the Uniswap platform. And there's a few of the tokens that are attributed to the developers and the team and the advisors, etc., etc. So... It's quite similar to a, a, a traditional ICO, except that the tokens are for free, basically. Um, and that, what's interesting in the regulation is that there's an exemption to some of the obligations of the regulation if the tokens are offered for free. But it's only applicable if it's really for free, right? If it's, if it's, given, if it's not given in exchange of a service of it, or if it's not given in exchange for something that you've done for them before, or something like that. So probably 
a part of the tokens would fall into uh, the regulation because they would not be considered offered for free. Uh, and then you will have the full uh, regulation apply. And then some of them may be considered as offered for free, and then you will have some exemptions. But in any case, you will uh, need to be a legal entity and to register yourself. And uh, if you have the full regulation applying to you, you need to draft a white paper. You need to, so that will describe all the, the issuance and how there's a few sections. Every section is detailed, so it's very detailed uh, regulation. You have to notify this white paper to the authorities, you have to publish it, and you have to comply with a few obligations uh, that ensure integrity, honesty of the issuer. You have to provide with a 40 days delay uh, where, the, where the consumer can retract his, his, his buy of the token, etc., etc. So basically, what we can say is that this regulation covers a lot of different assets, and it's really tailored for traditional ICOs, you know, the, the ones that we've seen in 2017 and 2018 with a white paper, with a, a set of, you know, you, you describe the project, you say, you, I will sell X tokens for X price. There's a, a pre-sale, a, pre a sale, a post-sale, I don't know. Um, and basically what we've seen in 2017 and 2018. And the obligations described in the white paper sections really reflect this uh, this analysis. So what I can say is that this regulation is trying to regulate something that really does not exist anymore today. Uh, there's a really, really, a, there's, there's not a lot of uh, traditional ICOs today. And all those, the, the, the token issues that we see are uh, very innovative. So, so just just stop there for a second because when you say a traditional ICO, you're talking about an ICO or one creates a project and is trying to finance that project by selling tokens to the community. Exactly. Okay. And that's what we've seen recently. That's that's not what we've seen recently, right? We've seen uh, very different approaches. We've seen uh, fair launches with a um, with a with a Yearn Finance. We've seen um airdrops with uniswap we've seen uh, so many different ways or so nfts that give rights to a token or a token that is airdropped to someone who has who has used a protocol or another one and those are edge cases that are basically falling in the regulation because you still are given a token and you you kind of enter into the into the the different uh uh, criteria, but then it would not really make sense to create a, a white paper. So it's it's really it's already something that's a bit an, an edge case. But really, what uh, what you have to to have in mind is that this regulation was tailored for old school ICOs, <laughs> and it's not really suitable for for the new ones for the new token issuance. When you, on the face of this, okay, you have to be a legal entity. You have to create a white paper. If I play devil's advocate here, I mean, that all sounds fine and good, right? It sounds fine and good to like have a company that's issuing a token and that has, you know, laid out its project in and thought about uh, all the different aspects of the project. And okay, maybe it's a bit of a hassle to submit that to the regulator. And but what what is really what is really the the problem here and how will it negatively affect uh, the industry, do you think? Well, that's that's really the fact that it's, as you said, is a, uh, it's good to have a regulation that basically covers the token issuances that are targeting, uh, you know, the general public and that will uh, sell a product in exchange of money and that will create, you know, it's it's basically um, a funding of a project, uh, a high risk project by the general public, and that's that of course needs to be regulated, and and that that's that's of course very important. But then uh, the regulation is very very broad and covers all the kind of token issuances, including uh, those who are very innovative and that do not uh, target the general public. And those token issuances may have some problems in Europe. So that, that that's basically that's basically it. Okay, so you're saying that a a, a project with a, an innovative token model may not be able to 
particularly like particularly articulate very well the project in a white paper like what what is the what's at the crux of the the issue here well, basically they won't be able to to respect the, the sections of the white paper they have to to, to respect right uh, because in the white paper you have sections on uh, you have to declare the white paper before the operation you, you have to declare period of issuance you have to declare uh, the, the a fixed price of the asset of, of the assets for a certain period of time you have to explain all the risks you are taking you have to explain so if you if you if you compare this to how for example year and finance was launched of course you won't be able to uh, describe all those conditions in a traditional white paper so that's something that would be very difficult to basically that would just render those operations out uh, illegal in in uh, in, in terms of um, of uh, the EU law, which means that the issuer uh, would be uh, considered as uh, as breaching the EU law, and the tokens won't be able to be listed in EU regulated exchanges. So that that's maybe the most important consequence that it could have. We'll we'll get to that part in in a little in a little bit. So essentially, if if we recap here on on this um, on this white paper requirement, what it does is it it creates a framework, a very rigid framework that is mostly targeted at what we described earlier as traditional ICOs, an innovative new type of token issuance model. Simply won't fit in that framework. They won't be able to comply with the different sections of that framework simply because they can't, simply because there is no such thing as maybe a sale price for that token, or there, there, there simply isn't room for that framework for those projects. And so therefore, all of the other consequences, like, for example, not being able to be listed, which we'll talk about in a second, would not be fulfilled. Yeah, and I think it's a it's a very broad uh, remark that we can say on the regulation, and maybe we should have started with that. Is that uh, the regulation was really thought and built for centralized actors and traditional actors that are equivalent to uh, financial actors. So the reasoning of the commission is that there's this new asset class called crypto assets. There's this new type of actors that are helping others buying and selling them and issuing them and who are even issuing them themselves. And we should just regulate them. So they have this um, this approach of the, the crypto asset sector that is basically uh, a pseudo similar to the financial sector and that you just need to basically replicate the rules of the financial sector to the crypto asset sector and then everything will be fine you just adapt them you just made them more progressive and and that's it and that's really how the regulation was thought about i think and in passing most of defi you know falls falls to the side that that's the the main issue because of course there's those actors in the crypto asset sector that are similar to the financial sector actors. They exist, and of course, uh, Kraken, and then and then and then Coinhouse, and then and then Bit Bitstamp, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They are, they can be considered as 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 similar to financial uh, sector uh, actors, right? But yeah, that's the whole point of the blockchain of being decentralized and the, to to have those use cases that are more on the control of the the user or the control of the the person who are using the protocols permissionless innovation that's what you're, what you're referring to yeah yeah exactly permissionless you can create tokens just by interacting with a smart contract that was deployed by uh, an anonymous an anonymous person you can I- I- intricate all the use cases together to create new products you can access to all those use cases without any kind of uh, permission and any kind of, uh, of a legal entity. And those use cases that developing quite uh, rapidly uh, those days are completely out. It's not. It's not. It's not that they are out of the scope, but they are out of the of the reasoning of the. Uh, they were out of the reasoning of the commission when when they built the regulation. And the issue is that they were out of the reasoning, but they are not out of the scope because the scope is so broad and uh, that it covers 
all all the all the use cases when you are talking about issuance. So by having a broad scope, many U DeFi applications and use cases are covered by the regulation, but they are not taken into account uh, in a way that m makes them feasible in Europe. Yeah, that that that's what that's what I think anyway. So maybe there's other <laughs> uh, other point of views, but yeah, Let, let's talk about stable coins before we get back to to crypto asset service providers or CASPs. So what what are the risks to stable coins? I've talked about this on the podcast a little bit, but um, I really want to get into the bulk of um, how DeFi stable coins like Dai are threatened by Mika. The stablecoins is issue is a very uh, political one, right? Uh, in in general, all the international institutions are looking at stablecoins, uh, either to issue some if you are uh, talking about central banks, or to regulate or to limit them, uh, etc., etc. So yeah, there's the Financial Stability Board that has issued a, a paper on stablecoins that uh, raised some risks. There's a paper on stable coins from the, the Central Bank of Europe, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the G7. Uh, so that all those uh, interest in the stable coins was raised by, uh, of course, the Libra project that was uh, announced a few years ago. And the approach now of the stable coins by all those institutions is very uh, defensive. So basically, the stable coins are seen uh, as a potential threat to the financial stability of the financial sector as a whole, which is quite a big threat, right? So the approach of the commission is to regulate every single asset that tries to replicate the price of another asset and to regulate it very, very strongly. Asset reference tokens. Yeah, so this is a new kind of token, a new definition, completely new, because, you know, you had those uh, definitions that were passing around on different uh, institutions of uh, utility tokens, payment tokens, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the EU decided to create a, a new way of considering the tokens, the, the stable coins. And basically, the definition is focused on the reference price. So as soon as you issue a token that has a reference price, sorry, the target price, basically, you are targeting this price, that is another asset, then you fall into the regulation. And that could be a crypto asset or any other asset. Yeah, the collateral, the way you you maintain this value, the way you try to reach this value is uh, irrelevant on this definition. So, for example, you have uh, USDC or USDT that are tokens that are uh, backed or supposedly backed by uh, real uh, real assets. Uh, so one USDT, USDC is supposed to be backed by one dollar in value. And then you have uh, the DAI who is issued by a smart contract and who is backed by uh, crypto assets, uh, namely uh, Ether or, or w WBTC, etc. And there's a system in the smart contract that ensures that the value of the collateral is always more than 150% uh, than the value of the DAI issued. But those two would be considered as uh, asset reference token or more specifically, e-money tokens, because they are targeting the dollar, which is a, a fiat currency. And they would fall fully into the EU regulation uh, with a lot of obligations that are completely, by the way, but we'll see uh, on this together, completely impossible to respect by uh, the DAI. Let's talk about some of these obligations and why are they uh, impossible to respect, specifically in the case of DAI, I think, which is the one that is stable coins like DAI are particularly uh, hindered, <laughs> to say the least, in this regulation. Yeah. So as I said, the, the, the approach is defensive. So the asset reference to tokens or e-money tokens are banned if from being traded in the EU or issued in the EU if they don't respect uh, all the regulation. And again, the regulation was uh, built with 
in mind centralized entities that have uh, you know a legal entity that um, that have assets that have uh, uh, like personal that that basically can fulfill some obligations by respecting uh, some very specific criteria and for example you for to issue uh, electronic money tokens you you need to be authorized as a credit institution or e-money institution so you need to respect the financial uh, the financial regulation you need to provide uh, all the holders with a claim on your uh, assets you need to allow for the redemption of the token at any moment upon request of the holders you need to invest the funds in secure low risk assets that are denominated in the same currency as the one referenced by the token you are issuing so those obligations are the obligations of electronic money token that would be backed by the same currency as it is issued in so you so you said something there that i want to just kind of stop on for a second and because it's it's so interesting so with dai for example the issuers of dai whatever entity that is or whatever entity the regulation would decide that is would need to provide a, to their uh to to dai holders the promise that they can redeem not ether but that they can redeem usd for the equivalent amount of their tokens that that's essentially what the regulation says yeah, yeah, that's exactly what the regulation says. So basically, the regulation is extremely broad, so DAI would fall into it. But the, the, the obligations that they put on the issuers of the tokens are such that it doesn't make any sense for the DAI. Because, of course, the DAI doesn't have dollars backing any die that's the whole point right so um if you if you force the die to respect those obligations you're basically banning them from the eu as a whole because they won't be able to respect the, regula the regulation or, or that wouldn't be die anymore okay so once again we're in a situation here where the regulatory framework is very broad it applies to you know, it applies to different types of cryptocurrencies, including stable coins, but it doesn't make certain types of activities feasible. Exactly. And another another funny thing is that, uh, that's not very funny, but uh, you cannot serve any kind of interests on stable coins in general in the EU. That's part of the regulation. And... Uh, this means that basically any kind of DeFi products that would include the serving of interests on any kind of stable coins would be considered as illegal in uh, in the EU. So you see, there's a few very significant issues in the regulation. The, the general framework and the general idea of being protective and to protect the consumers are really they, they really make sense, right? Because of course, it's very important if you issue a token that and you say it's worth one dollar. I have one dollar in my bank account. That there's some kind of regulation that that ensures that of course the the guy has one dollar in the bank because he said he had and uh, and 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 there's some kind of authority that that should be able to to check this. And this is very important because it's not really the case right now that all the the the, the stable coins issuers are are regulated so so uh, so clearly and it's not so clear that there's always this uh these funds backing all the tokens issued and we see where the the fear come from right because the regulation of course is a is a risk based approach so you see a risk you see a risk that the token is not properly backed so you issue regulation that makes sure that everything is properly backed that that makes sense what is the problem here is that there's again we are in block on the blockchain space there's so many innovative use cases that are decentralized that use new ways of creating value and etc and those are completely not considered by the regulation but still in the scope which is this is really the problem right uh, if they were not in the scope right okay you can have all, all, all the all your decentralized use cases uh happening 
outside of the regulation and that would really make sense. That's how it happens today, for example, in France, where the, fine, the current regulation does not include decentralized use cases. But that's not what the commission did. That uh, the commission did define define the the different use cases in such a manner that the decentralized use cases fall into the scope, but they cannot respect any obligation, of course, because they are uh, they are decentralized or semi decentralized. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that is what's so frustrating about this is it. This regulation, it's called the Digital Finance Package. One of the one of the things that they claim is that this regulation it aims to promote uh, innovation in Europe and uh, to make the EU more competitive. But in fact, it just it squashes an entire industry, or at at the least, makes innovation in that industry crawl to a stop. And, and that's what's just in, so incredibly frustrating. So let's talk about the part that is puts the nail in the coffin here. And that is how the obligations on issuers is taken into account with regards to crypto asset service providers and how it's really the crypto asset service provider rules that block access to the markets for any of these assets that don't comply? Yeah, so it's a very simple rule that's defined on Article 68 of the regulation that basically says that if you are a trading venue and uh, you have to decide which assets you want to list, one of the rules you need to apply is that the assets must have respected the white paper obligation and must basically have respected the issuer's obligation of the crypto assets of the Mika regulation. So if the asset did not respect this regulation, you are supposed to ban it from your trading venue as a matter of principle because it's not compliant with EU law in general. So basically the consumers in the EU uh, zone should not be able to trade it, which means that the centralized entities won't be able to list assets like the DAI, of course, because completely banned of the EU in general, and all the other assets that would be issued without respecting the issuance obligations. So we need to, of course, we need to remove this Article 78, and we are trying to do this. 68, sorry. So any... Any crypto asset that doesn't comply with Mika, so which has not complied with the white paper uh, requirements that we talked about earlier, or for example, stable coins that don't comply with Mika because they simply can't, should not and cannot be listed on any regulated exchange in Europe. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Okay. And it's even harsher for the for the stable coins because the stable coins again everybody's afraid of them. And the stable coins there's uh, penalties for just is- issuing them and uh, there's uh, they're really really banned from the EU if they do not respect the regulation, right? Okay. So l- let's let's take two examples here. Let's take the example of a regulated exchange like Bitstamp, an EU exchange, but any other exchange that operates in Europe, like Kraken or Coinbase or, or, or any of these other ones, uh, versus a, a, a DEX. How would this regulation affect these two types of exchanges differently? Well, the first type of exchange would need to be regulated under MICA and become a CASP, so Crypto Asset Service Provider as soon as they target the EU um, market in any way. So if they do marketing, uh, if, if they, uh, they are yeah, basically selling the products to the, the EU uh, consumers, they have to be regulated in, in Europe. That's the if they scope. have EU customers. Yeah, that's the scope of the regulation. Well, it's not only having EU customers, it's really targeting them. Because uh, if the consumers go and see you, uh, without you uh, targeting them specifically, then you are fine. But if you do any kind of marketing in the EU, then you are in the scope. And of course, if you are located in the EU, you are in the scope. So those 
entities that would fall in the scope need to need to register, need to uh, there's a whole approval process. You need to uh, file a documentation that uh, explains how you how you respect all the obligations of the CASPs uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, organization of your activity, uh, the guarantees you provide to your customer, the, the guarantee on the price, on the market practice, etc. There's market market abuses rules, etc., etc. And you would need also, of course, to respect Article 68, um, where you uh, define the products you can list on your uh, crypto assets, uh, on your crypto asset service provider, and you need in the rules to exclude all the tokens that are not in the scope of the regulation. So you would not be able to list uh, all the DeFi tokens, all the stable coins that are not regulated in Europe, etc. etc. If you are a decentralized exchange, but a truly decentralized exchange like uh, Uniswap, for example, of course you you don't have any kind of legal representation uh, and you don't have a marketing service and you so you won't fall into the scope of the uh, CASP and, of course, you won't be affected. Uh, so those uh, decentralized exchanges would probably continue to exist. There's the question of how the legal entities that would basically create and deploy those, um, those services could be affected in a way if those assets are used to uh, trade assets that are not uh, permitted in the EU, but it's not really clear in the regulation if there's a way to to affect them. So probably the DeFi products would, would be functioning normally, but then the centralized entity, which are the gateway, right, to the to the to the crypto assets world, uh, where you can exchange your euros against uh, crypto assets. They would need to be fully compliant with the with the CASP rules. Okay, so so uh, sort of centralized exchanges or exchanges that we typically see as centralized exchanges will need to register, will need to fulfill several requirements, but at the same time, will need to forego listing any token that is does not comply with the regulation. A decentralized exchange it's, could potentially keep listing those tokens of course it's hard to enforce any of that on a decentralized exchange so if you have a dex for example that has a governance model which decides on which tokens get listed it becomes nearly i think impossible to to really enforce any of that but there is still the question of what would happen to the legal entities which may or may not exist but if those legal entities do exist uh, what would happen to those? And even if there's no legal entity, I think we've seen in the past that even individuals or groups of individuals, like you know, open source developers or whatever, uh, you know, could be targeted uh, in terms of an enforcement action. Don't you think? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And th- this is more the you know the, cert- the uncertainty here that is uh, damaging because. Uh, it will be very complicated. You know, it's already very complicated to uh, convince an EU VC to invest in crypto assets industry uh, compared to, for example, a, a US-based uh, VC. But if you don't have any certainty on the legality that of your activity and on the fact that maybe you may you could uh, be considered liable for the exchange you are deploying on the mainnet, uh, for example. Of course, this will be detrimental to the development of the industry in Europe. Yeah. How does this affect mining and staking? Does, does the regulation uh, touch any of that? Yeah, there's a specific exemption from respecting the white paper obligation if you are issuing your token by ways of mining. But really mining, there's no mention of staking or... And there's, then there's no definition of mining, actually. So we don't exactly know how the commission uh, sees mining. Yeah, and what's, what's, what's telling about this paper is in the entire paper, there's not a, there's, it mentions mining once. And it mentions that exemption, but it doesn't define it or anything like that. To exclude from the obligation, yeah. And also... It's really it's not really clear how it really affects um, the operation because most of the assets that are mined are not issued by a legal entity, right? So they are already out of the scope of the regulation completely, which again raises the question of those as could those assets be listed 
in the EU. And so for Bitcoin, for example, Bitcoin is mined, but it is not a legal entity in the way the, the regulation requires that assets are issued by a legal entity. So there's there the question of whether Bitcoin or even Ether could be listed in the EU. Yeah, so they, they, they will be able to be listed presently because they are transitional dispositions, which means that if you did not respect the, the, the regulation before it came into force, well, of course, <laughs> you cannot be sanctioned because you didn't know of, the, of a regulation that did not exist at this time, right? But this means that if a new Bitcoin was issued like a month after the regulation came into force, then it would probably not be able to, to respect the obligation and then, and then could not be listed on exchange. And what, what's really interesting about this paper, too, is that it never mentions Bitcoin. It never mentions it. It never, it never even says the name of, of the currencies that it might be regulating. It just seems like a, there's just an oversight of, of the entire DeFi space. Like, let's regulate crypto, but let's just pretend that DeFi doesn't exist. This, isn't that the kind of message that, uh, that comes through when reading this paper? Yes, it's it's true that it's very telling that there's no single mention of any, even the word cryptocurrency is not there. There's no Bitcoin, there's no Ether, of course. There's no cryptocurrency mentioned. There's the terms crypto assets, the terms utility tokens, asset reference tokens, e-money tokens, and uh, and security tokens. So that's, that's the vocabulary of the commission. And it's very telling that they basically try to avoid the whole problem of characterization of the crypto assets by putting together everything except the security token and the stable coins. But everything else is like a huge, not very clear group of assets and everything is treated in the same way. Which makes sense if you if you don't want to discriminate or to go into too much of the details on how the things are built, issued, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And, and of course, there's such complexity on, on the different assets that uh, it really makes sense to have this broad approach. But then you should be very, very careful if you do that to avoid side effects. And they they obviously did not do this as we we would like them to to do, as we would have liked them to do. So we've we've talked about the you know the the issues with with compliance we've talked about the listing of these tokens or the the ban on listing these tokens which is kind of the nail in the coffin and then there's just there's the part of this regulation that seems like such a middle finger to the entire crypto industry which is the affordances that this regulation gives to incumbent financial regulated institutions like banks Describe uh, what kind of leeway this regulation gives to financial institutions. Well, it's really logical. If you still, again, uh, if if you have this broad approach of uh, the crypto assets being a new asset class in the traditional financial sector and having this view of the crypto asset actors as being some variation of the fin- traditional financial sector actors, then of course the conclusion is that, yeah, why not uh, granting to all the traditional financial institutions a full access to crypto assets with no specific obligations? And that's exactly what they did. So basically, if you are trading venue or if you are, if you are a broker or if you are any kind of... Um, uh, regulated bank, if you're any kind of regulated financial institution under the, the EU regulation, you will have automatic transcriptions of your activity to your closest crypto asset activity. So if you are trading, traditional trading venue, you will be able to uh, operate as a crypto asset trading venue. If you are a broker, you will be able to, you will be able to act as a crypto asset uh, broker with no uh, additional obligations, with no delay. And that's, of course, if you take the the point of view of the crypto assets industry, it's really really harsh uh, because basically the the commission is narrowing the space to what they understood it was uh, and just bans all the use cases they did not see, which is already quite bad. 
But in addition to this, they just opened the door to the crypto assets industry, to all the traditional financial sectors actors, which of course creates quite a big, uh, very quickly, quite a big uh, competition <laughs> in the space. Of course, if they are interested, but we, we will suppose that they are. This means that basically any bank can create can can become a crypto asset custodian. Any uh, yeah, so it's it's true that it's seen as you know the final blow <laughs> for the crypto asset sector in Europe for the actors that are already in place. It's not very positive. It is it does seem like a final blow. It seems very unfair to give to the existing financial se- sector all of the leeway to to be a crypto asset service provider without any of the red tape, but also for companies and startup in the crypto space or who are entering this crypto space, they will need to do additional steps. Like, so they will need to register. They will need to interact with the regulator in order to get the proper licensing, uh, et cetera. And who knows what that's going to look like? I mean, if we have any, if we have any, you know, experience with uh, dealing with administration in Europe, it's that things are usually slow and take a long time and and cost a lot of money. So there, there might be some bottlenecks there that are like additional uh, pains and costs for industry players. Yes, I can only agree on this. Um, that there's, you know, the procedure and the cost of the procedure and everything is a high burden on on the on the newcomers the the crypto asset sector uh, uh, players that are trying to create this new sector of activity so yeah maybe just to to be a a, a bit less grim about, about the whole the whole thing please <laughs> uh yeah <laughs> just on the bright side it's it, i haven't mentioned it and i think it's important to do it it's still good that the crypto asset sector was seen as an industry sector that exists as a whole, uh, as a new kind of uh, asset that can help reshape the financial industry in Europe. Because that was the initial, that, that that's where the whole uh, regulation comes from, right? There's this idea that there's interest in crypto assets and they need to be regulated so they can grow in a more precise and yeah uh, reassuring constraints. But yeah, it, I think that the fact that this regulation exists is still a good sign as being a recognition of the industry as a, a new industry. I don't see it that way at all. I see it more as a recognition of threat. I mean, <laughs> I, I see it well, as a recognition, but it, it recognizes that the crypto industry is a threat to the existing financial sector. It's a threat to incumbent players there might also be in there uh, some consumer regular you know consumer protection uh anti anti money laundering and sort of financial terrorism considerations but i think for the most part this was probably drafted to uh, give recognition to an industry but also make sure that that industry you know complies to the will of traditional uh, financial sector yeah, so I think the first part of your sentence is good, and then the other one <laughs> is less good. Yeah, it's true. Uh, I think um, you know it's always the issue when you create a regulation at uh, at such a high level as the as the EU. Uh, then you have so many actors that are already in the place, right? The incumbent players, they have all the lobby, uh, all the all the the relationships they can uh, in the commission, and they they already know how to bring their ideas to the to the commission and to make them understand what are their views on the subject. So, of course, the first draft could not be the perfect draft for the for the crypto assets uh, sector. Still, I think it's good that we have this initiative. The, the, it's really important to to, to say that uh, I'm not sure we've seen we say that already. It's the proposal of the Commission. It's the first step of the legislative proposal, and from there, there will be uh, the Parliament that will uh, amend the text, and there will be the Council that will amend the text, and then there will be the trilogue where the three different institutions will discuss together to create the final version of the text. And there's probably a lot of room for change, especially before the parliament 
maybe less before the council, but still there's probably things to, to change at this stage also. And I think the good news is that all the crypto asset sec- uh, players I've spoken to, all but also the French regulator and the French actors and the French, even the French financial industry, thinks that this first version of the text is too stringent and not really good for innovation in Europe. And I think if we can convince in a, in a short amount of time, because unfortunately there's a very very short proce- uh, uh, the procedure will be very 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 quick. We have a short amount of time to convince as much players as we can that this regulation should be amended. This regulation should be uh, basically refocused on the centralized actors and also make made more proportionate for these actors. I think those those are the, the two most uh, significant things that need to change. And those are arguments that can be heard by a lot of people, right? It's not stupid. It's really it makes it makes sense if you understand the the, the industry that those things need to, to happen. So there's still hope, I think, and um, and that's what we are trying to do at the end and and, and with different uh, European actors to make the, the, the text change and to make it a, a more suitable text for the whole industry. So let's talk then about the actions that uh, are being carried out by Adan and um, in coordination with other uh, industry associations in Europe. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of initiatives. The, the first and the most obvious one was to, of course, uh, raise our issues at our own national level. We're based in France, so of course we've seen uh, the French regulator, we've seen the French Ministry of Economy, etc., etc., and we we raised our issues. They were very receptive, so it's it's a good it's a good first sign, I would say. And then we are building cooperation between uh, different associations and industry players in Europe as broad as possible to help them also raise those issues at their own national levels, and together we would like to raise the same issues at the EU level, which is quite a challenge because we have um, a few initiatives existing in Europe already that, that, that raise the voice of the industry at the EU level, but not really like a, an organized lobby that would be already introduced and that would be able to pass those ideas with, uh, the, with the, the legitimacy of uh, industry body. But still, uh, they are really uh, looking forward, uh, hearing from the feedbacks from the industry. So as soon as we can reach them and, and bring them those issues we've raised, they should be uh, at least uh, listening to us. I think the main challenge we face is more like an edu- education challenge, right? Because uh, it's really difficult for someone who has not been in the crypto space for a long time to understand how different uh, those decentralized use cases are from the centralized actors for for the whole uh, DeFi space and how critical are the stable coins in the crypto space economy right now. And those two points uh, need to be completely understood by our interlocutors before we can go to the next level and make our proposals. So that's one of the reasons why uh, the actions we are uh, planning for include a huge focus on education and uh, and maybe it's more explaining our vision than you know sending them drafts of uh, amendments that would not make sense for them. What are some of the things that, like people listening to this here, uh, whether they are in Europe or, or even in, you know in the U.S. or anywhere else, if they have users in Europe, um, or if they're issuing a token that could potentially reach uh, EU um, users, there's a high chance that they will be affected by this regulation in one way or another. What is your message to you know founders of companies, uh, people who work in the crypto space, in order to have this regulation be uh, amended in time uh, before it gets passed and potentially um, you know wreaks havoc on on the crypto industry in Europe, but also I think it may have reverberations outside of Europe. 
Yeah, uh, well, I would say uh, reach out to us <laughs> first. Uh, I think the initiatives needs to be a bit coordinated at a minimum, just that everyone uh, knows what are the big timelines, who are the interlocutors that needs to be uh, to be actioned, who you can talk to, who is uh, uh, who will defend our positions, who is uh, uh, who is opposed to the crypto assets industry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's really important that we talk to each other and that all the initiatives are are, are made uh, in in uh, in general. If you don't have a clear idea of what you want to do, if you don't have any initiatives in mind, we can help uh, because we have uh, we are in the process of structuring a really focused initiative that would be the voice of the industry at the EU level. And uh, any help would be very much appreciated. That w- whether it would be uh, in, uh, in in your time, in your knowledge, or even the financial help, because it's very costly to uh, reach out to the EU. You need to you need to pay different interlocutors <laughs> to be able to reach to reach out to the, the right person. And I think either you can uh, reach out directly on the EU on the EU sector, or if you want to help bringing more awareness on the industry in general in Europe and you want to help uh, the Eden, you can also, of course, become a member of the association and then uh, the fees you would pay as registering as a member would help uh, for all those actions at the EU at the French level also, of course. Yeah, I would. I would. Uh, I'm, I'm going to put my my Aden hat on now, and uh, I'm going to say that you know anyone who's who thinks they may be concerned by this, whether they are in Europe or they have any dealings with Europe and are in the crypto space, should probably be uh, just sign up for the Aden newsletter. Uh, we send out a newsletter every month where uh, we uh, kind of outline all the things that we're working on, and that's a good starting point to get some more knowledge and get. Uh, more in touch with what ha- what's happening at the EU level, and of course, whenever we host events or you know publish blog posts about these topics, you'll get that newsletter. Uh, you can get the newsletter at adan.eu. That's a d a n dot eu. You'll get a pop up um, when you uh, sign up, and and of course, you can also reach out to the association um, through the website. We'll certainly be glad to speak with you about any concerns you might have, but also ways in which in which you can help. Uh, but yeah, the newsletter I think is a great resource, and it goes out once a month. It's it's uh, in French and in English. It's quite concise, and is a, a good um, way to keep your finger on the pulse. You know, one one maybe final thought to end on here, and I wanted wanted to, to talk to you about this a little bit. Is like if in five years from now, for example, you know, Mika has passed, and it looks a lot like the regulation that we have seen so far, right? If 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 it's hard to get those amendments through, and we basically get this regulation that stifles innovation in DeFi. Do you think there's an opportunity to create a totally alternate crypto ecosystem, a crypto ecosystem that would emerge organically as you know outsiders of this regulation and create a truly parallel financial system to what we have today, which is kind of like the you know the, the starting goal of, of DeFi and, and the crypto space? Do you think that there's an opportunity for that? I think it's it's quite possible, right? Because the, the tools are already there to create uh, use cases that do not really need regulation to exist. The the pain point is really like the entry point and the, uh, the exit point, right? If you, you want to buy cryptocurrency for the first time, you need an entity that has a link with the traditional financial sector. But as soon as you're in, you have all the tools already in place to have your whole financial life that you can create stable coins, you can exchange coins against ones against each other, you can create derivatives, you can loan, you can borrow. Those are all, all those use cases already exist and they, they can't really be stopped by uh, EU regulation. So it could very well be a side effect of misplaced regulation that all the innovative side of the blockchain space becomes a shadow side of the of the blockchain space in Europe specifically and in in parallel there will be the whole you know traditional financial sector that would take its place in the EU market with all those uh, affordances they have um, so it would be it would be quite a, a strange situation where all the crypto assets uh, proponents would be pushed out 
of Europe and would probably build those products with legal entities that are located outside of Europe just to avoid any kind of risks. And all the users would use them from Europe with no limitation because it's decentralized use cases, right? And then you would have uh, all the incumbents that would enter the markets and just provide very simple services like buy and sell uh, crypto assets that would be fully regulated. So that would completely change, I think, the the face of the market if um, the regulation would apply as it is right now. And that's 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 a funny thought because uh, that's already something we've seen with uh, the the problems we have with the opening bank accounts. You know, there's it's already a, a big issue in in France specifically, but I know it's the case in a lot of different European countries. If you have crypto assets, it's very difficult to open bank accounts because uh, banks don't want to deal with crypto assets in general. So more and more, with the tools that are existing, I see that members of the ADN, new members, they are asking me if they can pay in stablecoins directly the, the fees of uh, for becoming a member because they don't have a bank account. They, they are already out of the system, right? They are, they've built all their... Uh, use case uh, uh, without a bank account. They are financed by crypto assets. They pay with crypto assets and they don't need a bank account. So it could very well be that this regulation, if it's not amended to be more suitable for the crypto asset industry, it will accelerate this movement and create entities that are completely out of the system and that operates without a bank account, without any link, to the traditional financial sector because they won't need to do it and and they won't be able to do it. That's uh, I think it's a good note to end on. At least maybe there's some some positive outlook here. Anyway, uh, we'll link to the uh, then website, the newsletter. Also, uh, we recently hosted a webinar about this very topic in which we go into you know lots more detail about the technical aspects of this regulation which uh, I'll also link to in the show notes. It has the, the webinar itself, the slides, and, and a nice recap. Uh, so that's a nice uh, amendment to this podcast. Simon, thanks very much. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.